It's been great to be here throughout this past year, preaching here last summer. I hope you still all have your combs and are doing your part. It was great to be here for Carl's wonderful service of installation earlier this year, and now it's good to be here again, bringing greetings and appreciation for your support of our church's wider mission. You know, I talk about you. I talk about you wherever I go around the country. I tell people throughout the United Church of Christ just uh, about what is happening here at Trinity United Church of Christ in Akron, how the still-speaking God is doing a new thing in this congregation and community. I know that God is still speaking, for God still speaks to me when I am listening and attentive. I remember one message I received from God. It was back when I was starting this position in national ministries for the United Church of Christ and driving up to Cleveland from Canton every day. And I would go by one sign that was right in downtown Cleveland as I was driving to my office. And that sign, I thought, was a message from God to me every day. And that sign said, Where will you be in 2020? That was an insurance ad. <laughs> but I, I read it as, as just a message to me about where will we be? Not so much individually, but where will the church be? <laughs> where will our denomination be? Where will our congregations be? I was thinking a lot of that as I started doing this work in church development and with our national ministries and and really kind of pondering what the future held for the church. What would the future be for our churches, for our congregations, for our beloved denomination? Is there a future for the church today? I think every pastor faces that question. Every church leader sometime raises that question and deals with it in their ministry. You know, at the same time, I was reading from a Hebrew Torah that was given to me by um, Temple Israel in Canton, um, and I was reading from the book of Exodus, and, and if you remember, the book of Exodus begins with the sense that, that uh, peop- things have changed for the people of, of, of the Hebrews. So they are in Egypt And there's a new pharaoh, and the new pharaoh doesn't remember who they were and doesn't treat them well, and in fact treats them like slaves. And so they cry out to God, and there's a very clear sense in the beginning of Exodus that God is not listening, that God does not hear their cries. Now this Torah was really interesting. It's kind of their pew Torah. And it had the text in both Hebrew and then in English and then notes and then Midrash, or Jewish teaching on the texts. And as I was going by that sign every day asking, you know, where will I be in 2020? What's the future going to be like? I got to the text that we read here this morning. And it deals with that character Moshe, Moses, who was both... Egyptian and Hebraic who was raised in Pharaoh's house and then had to flee Egypt because he uh, uh, was gotten in trouble and he ran into the wilderness. And what did Pharaoh encounter in the wilderness? This is not a rhetorical question. (laughs) The burning bush. And what did the burning bush say to Moses? Well, first off, the burning bush said, Take off your shoes, for you are on holy ground. And then the burning bush said to Moses, Tell my people I have heard their cries. Tell my people I have listened to them. I've heard their cries. And I am going to bring them out of Egypt, out of slavery, into a land of blessing and freedom. And Moses, I want you to do this. And I remember a cartoon I saw of Moses responding back to the burning bush. And Moses kind of looks back at the burning bush in this cartoon and says, well, that's a good plan, but what would Alan Greenspan think of it? (laughs) And that's kind of uh, what Moses does. He says, well, that's a good plan, but who shall I say sends me? 
who shall I tell the people has sent me to release them? And who shall I tell Pharaoh has given me the power to do this? And God says, tell them. And what is the name that God gives? I am who I am. And if you know Hebrew at all, this Hebraic Torah goes on to say, you know that the word Yahweh, or Achad, Asher, Achad, is an interesting word, and it's very hard to translate because it just simply is the verb to be twice without uh, knowing what the, the, the tense is or the, uh, whether it's present or past. It's just to be, to be, with a conjunction in between that we're not really sure about either. So uh, you can translate it, I am who I am, but you can also translate it, I will be who I was, or I was who I will be. I've even heard it translated, I will be what I want to be, which sounds more like a five-year-old than our omnipotent God. And then it goes on, this Torah went on to give a name for God that I'd never heard translated in this way before. And the name that they gave for God was... I will be what the future demands. I will be what the future demands. And I went, wow, whoa, what a name for God. Indeed, what a name for the God who was exactly what the future demanded, what tomorrow required for the people of the Hebrews who brought them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea and into a land of blessing and promise. What a name for the God that we know in Jesus Christ who has overcome everything, sin and death and separation and tragedy to create and claim a future for us and to bring us into that future that God has created for us in Jesus Christ. What a name for the God that I know in my life when I am so far down in the pit that I have to just look up and say, God, you are going to have to do tomorrow for me because I cannot do it by myself. I don't have the strength for tomorrow. God will be what our future demands, what our tomorrow requires. God knows and will meet our human needs and and more. What a great God. What a provider of the future. You know, and so the question is not whether there is a future. God has the future. The future is in God's hand. God will be what our future demands. God has overcome everything. To make a way, to make a future for us. God has a future for us and for the church. I was powerfully reminded of the God who will be what the future demands and what our tomorrow requires and of the community that God is gathering together. When I was leading a habitat trip to Nicaragua from the Canton Habitat, we had planned the trip for two years It was back in 1998. The only thing we hadn't planned was to be in Nicaragua the same time that Hurricane Mitch came to Nicaragua. I'll never forget the email that my brother sent me after we had been airlifted out after 10 days. And he sent a little note that said, Hey, don't you get the Weather Channel? (laughs) He's a great brother. Well, I did get the Weather Channel, and I looked it up. And Hurricane Mitch was supposed to uh, sweep into the Caribbean and then go into Texas. But if you remember correctly, or Mexico, instead, Hurricane Mitch centered over Central America, and it poured 20 inches of rain down on Central America for 10 days. And it changed the little creek in our mountain camp from a two-foot thing that we could jump over to a 30-foot raging river that isolated us from the communities that we went down thinking that we were going to serve. And while we were there, everything, everything that I as a North American and our group relied on was stripped away from us. Information, communication, work, goals, security, the immediate availability of food, water, energy, And finally, our possessions. 
And while everything else was stripped away from us, we rediscovered again the one thing that could never be taken away from us, the one thing that can never be stripped from us, and that was our faith and the